Diaries. Thank you so much for agreeing to be part of our new season of, um, of interviews. So the reason I obviously wanted you to be on is because we're speaking to people who are ordinary, as we all are, but lead extraordinary lives. Mm. And I think you are, you, you fit, right? <laughs> you tick all of my boxes. Um, you are on Forbes 30 Under 30. Mm. You started the world's first um, art agency. Um, you're just a, basically a trailblazer. That's very sweet. <laughs> I mean, I'm trying my best. You're trying your best. You're doing really well. <laughs> um, so before we get into like the main body of our interview, I thought we would play a little warm-up game. To yep. kind of, you know, we've Which I'm prepared to fail yeah. miserably at. That's fine. Sometimes you fail and then you learn from failing. So it is called Hit the Button. Yep. You have a button I've given you. Yep. Uh, hit your button. Yep. It works. My button. And from somewhere behind us, we have a magic voice that will answer some random questions. Mm. Right, question number one. What is the most common phobia in the UK? Um, spiders. Sunshine? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's very harsh on the British people. I feel bad for them just hearing this. 58% of people say heights. Really? Okay. Yeah, what, what is it, sorry? Heights. Ah. Oh. Because we have so many. And public speaking. Ah. Oh. We are not afraid of that. No. <laughs> what language do Britons vote the sexiest? Oh, for yours. French. Yeah, it's got to be yours. Yours sounds hot. I would have been very <laughs> upset if it was Italian. I was like, damn the Italian, they always win this one. How many flowers does a honeybee need to visit to produce 100 grams of honey? 100? Thousand. I will say 3,000. And... 444,000. Wow. wow. We were completely oh, out. Oh my God. The poor thing. They work really out. hard. Yeah. We don't work hard at all. No. So what percentage of time is an average car parked? Percentage? percentage? Oh, I don't know. Uh, 60%. 96. I don't know who won that. <laughs> it's the winning is not important. It's the learning that counts. We, now we're warm to each other. I thought we would get into your car life story or even though you don't obviously drive mm. um, but you have had experiences connected to cars so it's still valuable. Um, so you, you're from a tiny island off the main body of the Yes, house. there's yeah. one road north and south and that is it. And that is it, so you, you've just trapped. <laughs> <laughs> so this is why it's pretty easy if you have no directions because you just know how to head to point A to point B. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. So, um, when you you were small, yeah, what's your kind of first car car related memory? Um, that's really interesting. I think like everybody else, um, you you know you are in the back of the car of your parents. Mm -hmm. My parents were very stressed with regards to their own cars, um, so I think I was always much happier to be in the back of the car of my grandparents, um, and I think. Ironically, we were the first place in France to have more cycling lanes than car lanes. Okay. So, sorry for so the car people, people but <laughs> we, we were pioneers before Amsterdam and before Paris put all the cycling lanes for having developed side by side even more cycling lanes. Mm -hmm. So in a way, the car stories were always put in perspective with the bicycle stories okay. and how they could cohabit together. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that has a very nice cohabitation. I think in a, in a way, I've always seen them two really nicely cohabiting. And when I think of London and how cab drivers and bicycle cohabit, they don't live very well together. So I've not been used to this. I've always been used to seeing everyone kind of using the road really nicely together. It's probably something to do with the fact that London isn't as pretty as where you come from. So I think we're a little... Yeah, more, more yeah and I think there's a real... Um, I think taxis, buses and cars are kings here. Mm. Um, in a way that in other cities they're less so. Yeah. Uh, you less think they're driving the road as much. So it's interesting how it maps out your understanding of cities. Mm. Um, and, and therefore my understanding of cities is much more at speed in the wind on a bicycle than it is within a compartmentalised yeah. car. Yeah. So you then moved, um, what age did you move away from? 17 um, and then set up in London um, and lived in LA for a year so again London is very much home I think it always comes to a point where you're an expat where you spend as much time 
in your new place than where you come from. Yeah. Very happy in London. Um, I still cycle everywhere. Yeah. I still cab everywhere. Yeah. Um, I think having just become a man, you, my relationship with cabs and cars have restarted yeah. because obviously electrical black cabs are the way to go when you have a pram. I love them actually. I really love electric cabs. They have the little window on top. Mm -hmm. Well, so I'm really pro eco-friendliness, so they have a really window on top where my baby can look up and also it's electric, yeah. which I really That's like, yeah. yeah, which so, is nice. So what's, when was your first baby kind of cab ride? Do you remember? I think maybe two days in. Okay. So you took, when you took her home? Yeah. Him home from hospital? Him, yeah. yeah. So what was that like? Did how, the nerves? Were you trying to get car seat in? I mean, I think help? like, yeah, you, you would know that. You don't really remember much of the early days because it's such a blur. Um, I actually have a lovely picture of four days in us going into a party with Atlas because he fell asleep um, straight away by the DJ. And, and there's that picture of my lovely man, Atlas and I in the, in the cab, just like, and you just, but all these things are in a blur because you just gave birth. Yeah, yeah, so you're just obviously trying to survive it. And, and but I, I'm so glad I rode life so intensely. And I mean, bless him, like, He's attended as many things as possible. He's, um, he's been, you know, packed in the back of a cab um, with me at any event we were launching, any public art projects we were launching. Um, it's been quite magical to see him in the speed of things. I love speed. Yeah. And we, we spoke about this where I like to leave things at speed. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm glad he's part of that. Yeah, that's beautiful. It's, it's nice that you, you, your motherhood isn't exclusive it doesn't exclude your child, which I think sometimes... I wouldn't want him to have a different speed. Yeah. ...means that it's separate to being, you know, a mother. Um, when I, before we go back to your life with Atlas, um, your baby, mm. you spent some time in New York. Yeah. Um, how, how was that? It, it's a obviously been a completely different setting yeah. to London. It's a very intense, addictive city. Mm. I think most people have burnouts from it. Yeah. Um, I'm obviously super hyperactive and slash a very addictive personality, so I loved it. I liked every part of it. I could have said in New York, the reason why we built the company here is because my network was more powerful here than it was in New York. But it, frankly, it could have been in New York. There was no difference between, for me between London and New York because it's again a city that is vibrant in the heart of most things. Like New York, you can travel everywhere in the States in, in short flights. And London has this where you can just jump on a flight everywhere and you feel in the heartbeat of things. Yeah. And I like the fact that they both at the heartbeats of things. Mm -hmm. um, but my network was not as, as powerful than the one here. And when you build your own company and of course being a talent agent for the artists, you need to activate a lot of powerful yeah. network for their carriers. So London made a lot more sense. Mm -hmm. So when you were in New York, um, Obviously, there's the iconic yellow taxis that they, they have there. What, do you remember like the first time you kind of got in? Was it like this whole big Apple experience that was quite, you know, quite romantic? Or was it just quite something very different? Yeah, that's it. Like, I would say I prefer the black cabs mm -hmm. um, than I, the yellow taxis. I, for sure, like hailing it like Sex and the City, Carrie Bradshaw does have that feeling of you're in New York, but there's just something about the aesthetics of the black cab and how spacious it is in it that you really do feel, you know, I mean, going on Tower Bridge in a black cab and then seeing Tower Bridge literally from the top window to all the windows is so dramatic. It has almost like a 360 cinematographic element to it, yeah. which a yellow cab doesn't have. Mm -hmm. um, and that's always the reason why I've always loved the black cabs. They have this you could really, like I sometimes take people around in the cities through Black Cab, because mm -hmm. you can really see so much of the city through it. I feel more con contrived than the Yellow Cab, and I like my space, I like my horizons of that thing. This kind of goes back to where you started life, you know, in, in, um, in your island, is just having that freedom, so obviously yeah. in the city and visually. Life, yeah, there's everything so high, and then in the car you're very much confined. It yeah, I would want a car in New York that you could look up. Yeah. And I think the yellow cabs don't do that. They restrict, they don't open up visually. And I guess my whole job is about visuals. So yeah. I like to be excited visually. And maybe that's why I never took on a driving license. I like to be the passenger that looks at things mm -hmm. more than the person that actually purely drives it. Yeah. Um, but 
the, the, the black cabs are too restrictive per se, yeah. visually. Yeah, I hear that. So let's move on to you as um, the entrepreneur, the, you know, the mother, the woman. Um, so you were, I think, was it 21 when yep. you first started MTR? Um, 25. Um, 25, okay. 21, I was managing the Gary the Outsiders here in London. Okay. My first boss spotted Banksy. Um, and then I was running this for two years, was approached by an investor who was based in LA to run, to basically co a gallery, he would invest in me. And then when I was in LA, um, I kind of discovered the way talent agencies were running um, and how powerful they were for the talents. And I was talking to my talents and my clients and it felt like it would be much more effective than the gallery to push their carriers forward. Um, so that's this how I decided to kind of build it back. So that was when I was 25. Yeah. So this is a huge thing to do. Like you're first. To be first is an accomplishment. But you must have, did you not have imposter syndrome? Did you not just feel like you were kind of maybe out of your, out of your depth zone at any point? How did you tackle those kind of feelings? That's interesting. I, you know, I think I was just really ignorant um, in a good way. I was young. I was fed up with what I had seen. I didn't think it was working. And I was also, I genuinely believed there was a better way to do it for building the reputation of the talents, but also building a much larger scale business in the sector. I was convinced of that. I mean, my team always says, I'm super instinctive the way I do business. I'm very lucky that my senior team is not instinctive. The reason I say this is because you need a complementarity of this, but um, I'm lucky to have had instinct, and we talked a bit about it earlier, where you know, to have full mindset and to be confident to like you drive a fast car, um, where you follow your instinct and you turn quickly if you made the wrong decisions and you turn again. And I'm just always connected life like, that way. So if I have a strong instinct, I just go for it. I don't wait until I get it verified by hundreds of people. I just trusted, go ahead with it. And my instinct was, this will be the next thing um, in the arts. I mean, I now realize how stupid that I hadn't, you know, tried to verify this was the case before. I obviously invested a lot of resources. Mm. The biggest irony that like my team said is that we were right, but yes. obviously I should have extra verified it. So please don't do this at home. Do verify whatever you go for your instinct. I mean, the truth is that we are, Talent agencies are currently seen as a lead new business model for the sector. Mm -hmm. And it's fascinating, I think it, exactly what you're saying, it's, it's crazy to think that a kid, because I was a kid, that has an instinct, that feels, fuck it, I want to follow my instinct, gets verified. Mm -hmm. And I think brain-wise, it's a bit like going into becoming a parent, because you're like, I now have responsibilities because I've discovered something that is generally can add value and I need to make sure that it does add value the right way, it does scale the right way, it does incorporate as many people that are amazing to it. So in a way, I'm such a different personality to the one who was intransigent, uncompromising, you know, ignorant mm -hmm. and posh at instinct. Yeah. Now I'm the exact opposite. And, that's, and, that, and, and I hope this will be the personality that would therefore enable that business to scale. Yeah, but the thing is, it's, um it's a very, like I said, it was a very ballsy thing for you to do. What's the hardest lesson that you've kind of learned from just following those instincts? Um, I don't know. I'm not someone that gets upset about being hurt from failure. You know, we talked about it, about the game where um, I don't, I don't fear consequences. Okay. I've been raised to you know, I, in a way, I don't fear risk, I don't fear consequences, and I don't fear, not death, but I think high risk doesn't frighten me. Okay. Um, and I don't know where that comes from. I think I've got a granny that was always taught me on picking up the consequences. She was a resident during the war. She had this kind of strong personality. And, but I don't fear consequences because I trust myself to pick up the consequences. And in a way, like, I split from my first partnership I've already gone through, therefore, that court case of splitting up and resetting of the company. There's little that I fear. Um, and, and I said this having been broken, having not had much support in the first place. Mm -hmm. And that's from your family, not having a lot of support parentally. Yeah, but it's a good thing. I mean, I think in a sense, like, I'm, by not fearing it, I'm able to take this risk, but I'm also able to uh, correct them if they were wrong. Mm -hmm. So 
I'm just, it might be ballsy, but I, I think I don't want to take credit from just being bold. I think it's just because my mind doesn't value risk the same way as somebody else. Yes. I'm comfortable yeah. being in a life of risk, okay. if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. And there's a lot of people who aren't. Exactly, and, and psychologically who, I am. Yeah, I mean, I'm pr pretty much one of those people who I, I think everything through a million and one times. That's very good. <laughs> that is the reason I'm in business with people like you. I, I think this is wonderful that people like this exist. Yeah, but sometimes you end up not moving, you know. You yeah. end up, and now I have this sentiment in my head that the, the universe demands that you take action. That's and interesting. Which is something I feel like you just instantly... Yeah, so my actions come faster than people yeah. expect. Yeah. Um, and I have to watch out for my actions not come as fast. Okay. There's, you know... Do you have safeguards now in place or people that, that you use to check yourself before you make these decisions? Yeah, definitely. I mean, thank God, I, I do check myself. I, I could send things, so actions or emails or say things really quickly mm -hmm. and do it as well. So I wouldn't just say something, I would just go on and do it. You have to be watchful when you have that personality on the damages because I don't feel damages the same way that somebody else might do. A damage for me is just part of a process, it's never an end. So I'm not traumatized by it, mm -hmm. um, whatever that damage is. But obviously, people are very hurt by them. Um, and so I think that's always where I've learned to be surrounded by people who first were teaching me about this, mm -hmm. and second, I could call if I was making the wrong action. Yeah. But no, it's just, it's, it's, I, I just love risk. I love speed and the running. I just love taking risk. Okay. So if you could speak to somebody who is, I've got a great idea, mm -hmm. but doesn't know what to do, what advice would you give them? I think that's actually, you know, listening to your personality, this is where we're all different. If someone has my personality, just go. Mm -hmm. You hit the wall 10 times, but then at the 11th time you find the door. Yeah. And if you have that personality, that's completely fine. You're not going to be traumatized by it. But if you're someone that's going to deeply affect you, mm -hmm. then I do think you need to check everything before you make partially any action. Mm -hmm. Because I just wouldn't want you to recover or being hurt by going through that process. It really depends what processes you're okay with. You know, Amazon is known for having a lab where they launch 10 ideas every few weeks and then they kill most of them and they just keep one every few months. That's much more the way I'm used to doing things. Mm -hmm. um, and if I look at my team, like Elise was, I have quite a few ex-entrepreneurs on my team and, and Lise is the opposite. She needs to verify every part of the decision. She then will go ahead with the action because she's not comfortable risking certain consequences. Mm -hmm. So I think for me, it's just, I wouldn't want to just give a generic advice. I would completely base the advice on the psychology who I have in front of me. Mm -hmm. In the same way that it's the same with my artists, I would not be advising psychologically the same thing per, per talent. Yeah. Because you want them to be able to take that pressure mm -hmm. of whatever the consequence will be. Yeah. And we're not equal on how we take that pressure on. Uh, and there's no right and wrong, and there's no better or lower. It's just completely how we're going to be coping. Mm -hmm and you need to be the driver on how you cope. So if you're not, if not the right consequence for you, then you will fail at it. Yeah. The question that I ask everybody yeah. is about legacy. Yeah. As a mum, as an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. as a woman, mm -hmm. what would you like your legacy to be? Um, that's interesting. I, um, what do I want my legacy to be? I always think, you know, this is funny. I always think about setting people free. Mm -hmm. So like, I think I would like MTL to not need me anymore, yeah. where like it's become such an amazing company that it doesn't need me. In the same way that I feel I'm, I've given birth to that, Atlas doesn't need me at some point, you know? And so I, I don't know if legacy is just that for me, that you just build things that are hopefully sustainable mm -hmm. and that they, yeah, that they've got support in themselves that they don't need you. Because I think legacy is thinking about death in a way. Yeah. So of course you need to make sure that they don't need you. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm just, that's my only legacy. I would be happy that my son is just a happy kid, you know, self-sustained, who does what he loves and that my company strives yeah. beyond me. And, and anything that we set ever has the same impact without needing me to be there. Yeah. If something happens to me, I think that's the safest. Okay. Oh, sorry, this is obviously very no, dark. No, 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 no. It's, it's, a, it's a, a true answer, so it's, it's just, I think it's, it's, that's the way I think about legacy. Yeah. I don't need to have portraits or God knows. Mm. Like, it's just... You don't need to be a Mona Lisa in no. galleries. 
<laughs> no, there's no need. It's just more really making sure that every idea can still run itself without you. Because yeah. if you believe that the idea is valuable, then you hope that idea will strive without you being there. Yeah, 100%. That's a brilliant answer. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Sorry, it's quite deep. Thank you so much thank for, you for having me. with me. And thank you for sharing your story. And I can't wait to see what you do in the future. Oh, thank you. And vice versa. Thank, thank you so you. much. If you love these interviews, and you really should, please don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe. Hey.